Citizen Com 2954. Um, there's a lot more of you here than there were when we were here last year, five years ago. Um, there was 1,200 people. There's almost 5,000 people in the building today, which is amazing. Uh, I'm so grateful. I'm, I, I know a whole bunch of you around that have come from around the world to visit the lovely sunny Manchester. Uh, but inside here, there's going to be a lot of very cool stuff, although in this up-and-coming presentation, you may see a few things inspired by the Manchester weather. Um, anyway, so... Uh, uh, like the first title of our first presentation, Brave New Worlds, we're on the cusp of a new era for Star Citizen because server meshing is finally a reality. People are making their first jumps to pyro in Evercathy testing right now, which is pretty awesome. We're going to have it out at the end of this year. Um, so I think it was going to be a great new phase for Star Citizen. Uh, and over these next two days, we'll talk about the new tech and tools in Star Engine that will help us craft those worlds that you're going to be flying around to. And you'll hear about our plans beyond 4.0 and how we get towards Star Citizen 1.0, which is out of alpha and for everybody to play. Um, and a little later this evening, I've got a special surprise for you, so you definitely want to stick around for the 5.30 show. Um, anyway, the team has worked really hard on the lead up to CitizenCon and this year to work on, first of all, what you've been playing in live, what you're going to be playing, what you're going to see here. Um, so I'd like to thank them all for working extra hard and putting all their love and care, just like you guys love and care what we're building, into what we're doing. So thank them and you guys. And without me waffling on, I'd like to bring CIG's CTO, Benoit Bezager, did I say it right, Benoit? Yeah, okay, good. I'm always bad with French surnames. Uh, to this stage to start our journey into the future. So let's have a great show. I'm not going to need, need this anymore. anymore. Cool. cool. I am Benoit Beausejour, or as some of you know me, I am Bolt on Spectrum. Today, we will talk about Brave New Worlds. This is Pyro 2, Monox. It's a barren planet, not really habitable. Now, since the advance of our planet tech, we've always allowed players to circumnavigate planets and move from orbit to ground seamlessly explore complex areas and intricate detail. Now with server meshing, we're gonna need a lot more locations for missions and destinations for more life. But there's a major question that has always followed this project since the beginning of Alpha 3.0. How are we gonna make a large number of planets and systems? How are we gonna meet the fidelity benchmark we've established? In this technology update, we bring life to lifelessness, even to Monax. We take the physical representation of the terrain, the geology, the atmosphere, the climate, and the environment to create accurate biomes that spring naturally from the collision of all these environments. Coherent, denser biomes that follow the laws of nature that we encode into data, data that we then leverage to place flora and fauna, yes, but also settlements, buildings, alien and human life in a planetary context. This creates worlds that are scientifically plausible, richer in gameplay opportunities. We want you to find adventure just by going around the planets without a quantum point. We want you to find actions along your path. For this, we are changing how we made the game. We are scaling how we made the game in all areas. This is not just a planet tech update. This is a collection of systems that we call Genesis. Now, 
to help me explain all this nice work and this nice technology, let us kick us off. And I welcome our very own Allie Brown and Will Hine for phase one of Genesis. Hello, hello, Star Citizen. Yes, yes hello, hello, Citizen Con. Yeah. So let's start with some introductions. This guy over here is Will Hain, aka Water Guy or River Guy. And this lovely gentleman is Ali Brown, pusher of Pixels Extraordinaire. And we're here to tell you about phase one of Genesis, which we're entitling The Laws of Nature. And this revolves, revolves around the fundamental approach we use to build our planet and is the literal foundation for everything else we're going to talk about in this talk today. Now, it centers on data-driven, physically-based rules that we aim to realistically emulate nature and its incredible diversity. Before we dive in a bit deeper, let's just recap on some of the things we already have on our planets. So here you can see our lovely atmosphere and our cloud rendering, which can provide some spectacular views. We have our on-the-fly terrain generation, which is no loading screens in our game, which we're very proud of. And then we have our scattering system that can populate these planets with many different diverse biomes. And we've been setting quality benchmarks for each of these biomes as we come across them one by one. But what we have isn't perfect. This scene on Microtech, it looks great, but it's not getting the same density that you'd expect from a real pine forest. That's one of the things we want to solve. The other, if I take you to the other side of Microtech, you'd be excused if you thought we'd just turned around and looked at a different part of the forest. Why is that? Well, this is because currently our artists create slices of biomes in great number, and then they distribute them across the planet using humidity and temperature properties. Each slice looks great in isolation, as you've seen, as you've explored. But this is not the solution to give us varied and natural biomes across an entire planet. Additionally, just using humidity and temperature limits us to only two degrees of variation. And that's not enough for the sorts of planets and worlds that we want to create and for you to explore. So how are we going to scale up our planet generation? Well, as I said before, we're going to start with physically-based rules that drive everything. We want nothing to feel random on these planets. We want no limitations on the number of biomes. We want infinite biomes that are continuously changing across the planets. And we want extreme density, and we want to maintain or exceed all of the quality levels we've set with our existing biomes. And most importantly, we want it to be scalable so that we can really scale up to the level of content that the designers are expecting. And from your perspective, we want you to be able to truly explore and find unique playing opportunities everywhere on our planets. So to start this, we're going to need more data. So if we see here some of our existing data sets on our planets, we have temperature, which we define locally and globally, and humidity, and that's it for now. With Genesis, we add many other data sets, such as the geology type, the soil type, and then we also go for things like the soil depth and the quality and the nutrients, and many other properties all drive this complex data set that we use to build rule sets on that each individual asset can describe how it should work with them. We're going to put something together and show you some demos today using some of the assets that you've already know and love in the PU. Although you might see some new stuff later, we'll save that. What you're going to see is a vertical slice of development. It's very early stages, very work in progress. You might see some bugs, but that means it's only going to get better, so be excited. The number one challenge with planets in our game is scale. In no other context do you need a planet to look great from first-person perspective when you're stood among the trees. You need it to look great when you're in a spaceship at a quantum marker miles away and everywhere in between. There are no loading screens. You see everything. We cannot afford for it to look bad in any of those scenarios. So let's start from a ground perspective. Demo number one. Let's have a look.
How do we make that? Thank you. Thank you. So, let's talk about first what's underneath it all. The ground! So... <laughs> So, in our previous terrain shader, we just switched between different ground textures depending on climate and didn't really consider the unique properties of each type. Now, the terrain shader is based around four layers. We always first consider bedrock at the bottom of it all. Then, where appropriate, we add layers of soil of different types. We then add debris where appropriate, whether it be pine needles, dead leaves, etc. And then, when it gets cold, we add snow. Each of these layers has unique shading properties and unique transitions between them. Because we do this all in one shader, we're able to achieve that as well as being performant. We can also use things like water saturation to darken and tint the soil and other properties to make it look more realistic. But that's not what filled most of the screen in that demo. That's the vegetation. Like what Ali said, we want to emulate the laws of nature. So in Genesis, we have rule sets for every asset that tells it how to respond to our rich data, whether it be soil type, water availability, temperature, geology, or whatever. We assess the viability and the vitality of each asset and compare them to decide what is likely to spawn in a natural environment. This automatically creates the cohesive environments that you saw in that clip. Not handcrafted anymore. No one has told those ferns and those pines to be like that. They each want to be like that. And that's what we're doing. Multiple assets coming together to create a unique microbiome. What about trees then? Same thing. They have a larger requirement for space. They have a larger requirement for nutrients. That's how you see the distribution, and it's how it all works. Let's meet the flora that came together to beat that forest, to beat that forest, to make that forest, and have a look at some of their properties. Now, just to note, they are all going to look quite similar because we've already seen them in the same place, so they must be similar. So, building blocks, like grass, and common grass, medium amounts of sunlight. We had ferns, see it's a much lower requirement for sunlight. We had salix bushes forming our undergrowth, and we had pines, of course, and multiple variations of pines. Diversity is driven by competition. Everything has ideal conditions which affects its competitiveness. We also have additional control over this in the form of dominance, which allows us to make one asset more competitive and more dominant than another, which is just what we see in nature. Everything is constantly fighting for resources and, of course, light. Because we spawn these assets in a hierarchy, it's easy to propagate shade data down over the distribution of the assets so that we can control ones that prefer or reject shade. Often, like these ferns, they can spawn in light, but they are outcompeted in those scenarios most of the time. So you will see a rogue fern, or a place where there's no seeds for a specific asset, you might start to get this coming in. Let's take a look from a larger perspective again. So to take a few some of the things we saw in that clip, let's talk about rocks first. So anyone that's done a lot of ground driving and ground vehicles might have seen that our rocks sometimes feel a little bit randomly scattered and can be quite an obstacle sometimes. So in this clip, you saw that the, the rocks are no longer randomly scattered and they're now placed based on physically based rule sets. And this logical grouping is, is achieved via erosion simulations, which we run offline to build localized data maps. And they describe the size of the aggregate and rocks and the density and where they should naturally form. And that means we get things like these natural clusters of boulders at the forest edge underneath the cliffside. And on that note, you might have noticed that the cliffs have been dramatically improved in how they shade. We also get to see things like the natural clumping of vegetation caused by seed dispersal. This is controlled per species, so we can get better emulation of their unique growth patterns and create a much more realistic environment. 
And we also calculate the slope aspect, which is the exposure to vegetation to solar radiation and other environmental factors. And this allows us different species to flourish in different conditions, as we can see on different sides of this valley. Then over larger scale, we calculate the age and vitality of each tree individually to drive exactly how high they should be, but also the color of their leaves. Now, this isn't the only thing that will drive the color of the leaves. We're going to introduce the concept of seasons to the game. And this will mean our planets will evolve through the year, and we'll be able to shed leaves from trees and have the grass wither in winter. So as you're starting to see, all these rules, all this data, it's all coming together to create what we call truly emergent biomes. Let's have one more look at how this varies over a much larger scale. Just like in real life, oh, thank you. Just like in real life, our areas should vary, even by traveling a few kilometers. If you get in a helicopter and fly over the Alps, it all looks a bit snowy, but when you look closer, it's constantly changing. And we're now able to accurately represent that with our changing data. Another very important factor to mention is the distant look. In this screenshot, you don't see a single tree, and yet the, tree, the terrain is still green. We previously did that with artists made lookup tables that told the planet what color to be at what position. But that wasn't going to work with all our new data and our far more complex spawning. Now we have a systemic solution. The planet shader is able to intelligently evaluate what's going to spawn there using the same rule sets that cause the assets to spawn there. When you get there, that means we can sample the sort of color that that is going to project onto the orbital view and use it. We get a far better accuracy from the result. Together, by creating rules and authoring data that works, we create a continuously varying planet that sets the scene for the incredible exploration gameplay I know you guys are going to have. But how have we done this without compromising on performance? So yeah, with all this new data sets and these physically based spawning rules, you're probably wondering, how is this going to handle in your CPU? We don't want to melt anyone's CPU. So we've redesigned all of this tech to work much more efficiently than before. And now it can run on many cores. This allows it to be run perfectly well on both the CPU and the GPU. So we've redesigned our framework so that we can run it at both and swap between them freely. Now, the benefit of this is we can do things like, first off, move the terrain system to the GPU. And we've now done that to get some incredible performance improvements. But we then also cache the results in something we call a virtual terrain texture. I'll give you a quick demo of this now. This is now vastly faster than the previous system. But it also allows us to generate the terrain in much higher resolution, which means all the popping you can see on the mountains as we're approaching, all of that should be completely eliminated on the right-hand side of the screen. With the extra headroom we've gained by making our terrain system more efficient, we've been able to introduce some improvements, including high resolution ground textures, proper blending between surface types, and of course, better tiling. If you're familiar with any of our planets, we've taken off all the assets so you can see the issue. 
And now how it looks, you don't see those lines going at all. <laughs> and one more. With the terrain data cached on the GPU, like Ali said, we can perform the scattering there too, which is significantly faster. All those algorithms that we've used to generate those first bits can run there without being more expensive on your CPU. And it also means the results are directly there on the GPU. We can render straight from them. That allows us to have dramatically more density in our new system. We can render objects directly without having to go via the CPU every frame. We also cull at different levels of granularity with bigger groups in the distance and individual assets up close. Just as a demonstration, this is the sort of density you can expect on Microtech today. And in a second, we'll flip over to what you can expect from the new upcoming tech. In a second, we're going to turn on the culling group, Steve Oak, so you can see. These are the groups that we create of those trees and of the terrain. And as we get closer, we shrink them so we're more intelligently rendering what we need without having to assess each tree individually, all the way down to the ground. So to recap some of the things you've seen here in phase one, we had data-driven rules based on physically-based data, generating emergent biomes that continuously vary across our planets to get infinite possibilities. And we've achieved this with much greater density than before and much faster rendering. And we also achieved seamless transitions from ground to space with zero popping.